This morning, uh, we're going to look, uh, I think, at what you already have heard numerous times, and that is the importance of knowing Jesus Christ. What I'd like to do is read for you the, the text, but in its context. The context being uh, John chapter 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. And as I read this, understand that one who loves you more than anyone on earth loves you, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, prayed for you in this prayer. And even in doing so, explain to you what his work in you was really all about. So do see the heart of the Savior and seek to understand as I read this what it is that he, he really does desire for you. John chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse 1. I'd like to read the, the whole chapter, but we are going to be focusing on verse 3. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given Him, He may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent." I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled." But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing uh, this morning. And again, I hope you saw in the heart of our Savior 
the desire that we would have his love in us and that we would know him and know the Father and the Son so that the world may know that we are his disciples and that he sent Christ into the world. We are to be living examples of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we are called Christians. Well, what I'd like to do is, is consider as we begin what it is that we as Christians already understand about what is most important to us in this world. And I think you understand that that thing is eternal life. That's something that's really more important than anything the world has to offer us, more important than any relationship we have or any relationship we hope to have, more important than anything we possess, any possessions, any houses or or, you know, cars or whatever it may be, whatever the world may have to offer. More really than the world itself. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples on one occasion. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Now, if that's the case, what good really is the world at all? I think um, many of us were sort of alerted to that uh, this last week, I believe it was, when a very high-profile celebrity uh, committed suicide. I think sometimes we're tempted to think, you know, that uh, I'm not going to be happy unless I have the world, you know, and if I have enough of the world, I'll be happy. But you know what? The people that have the most of the world are the people who are the least happy and the ones most liable either to, as it were, go off the deep end in bizarre behavior, to self-destructive behavior, or even to take their own lives because the world just doesn't satisfy. Again, who had more of the world? Well, I suppose there are a few than Robin Williams and who had more of, of the world's attention. And I know that there have been some videos going around about Robin Williams saying, well, he believed in God and so forth. But you know what? The Bible says everybody not only believes in God, but everybody knows that God exists. The fact that he acknowledges that doesn't mean he's a believer. And the fact that he would take his life really means he had no hope. Well, you see, only God can give us the purpose that we need to live. He is the most important thing we could possibly possess. He is the one who gives us hope that there is a future. Eternal life is the most important thing that we could possibly possess in this world. But let me ask you this question this morning. Do you really understand what eternal life is? Yes, it is salvation from hell. I mean, that's usually what we think about when we think about salvation. He saved me from the consequences of my sins. I don't have to suffer forever in a place of darkness and fire for eternity, away from any kind of comfort or blessing. And that is a great blessing, by the way. And yes, it is going to heaven to be able to enjoy the presence of God forever, and of course, the presence of the saints. It is a quality of life, being able to enjoy the blessing that is in heaven. Maybe you, you recall there have been times when, you know, Jonathan Edwards in particular and the Puritans described heaven not as a place that is so, you know, beautiful that you're overwhelmed by its beauty or so precious because it's made of the things we think are precious in this world, like gold and silver and precious stones. That's not the way the Puritans described it. They described it as a place where God is, where the Spirit is there fully, and where we're swallowed up in the love of God. Now, that's what eternal life is, being in the presence of God and swallowed up by His love and being so filled with His love that we love Him with a perfect heart. But we need to realize that it's still much more than even that. Eternal life, our Lord Jesus Christ tells us in this chapter that we've just read in this particular passage, is a relationship. It is knowing God, and it is knowing His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, became a man in order that He might reveal His Father to us. He is exactly as the Father is, which is why he said to Thomas on one occasion when Thomas said, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. 
And Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, have you known me so long? Or have, you, have I been with you for so long and still you don't know me? Jesus isn't saying I'm the Father, but what he's saying is if you've seen me, you have seen the Father because Jesus is the image of God. He came down to reveal the Father to us. He came down that we might know the Father and that we might know Jesus Christ. But again, I wonder how much we really understand what that means. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. What does it mean to know the Father? What does it mean to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I'd like to suggest that it means at least four things. First of all, that you might know of Him. That's a sense in which uh, we know Jesus. That we might know about Him, uh, what He is like. That we might know Him, that is, that we might actually be in a relationship with Him. And that we might know personally or experientially Him. In other words, what it's like to be like Him and to experience what it is He experienced in this world. So let's consider those four things for a few moments. First of all, Jesus Christ came that we might know of Him. Now, I think it's quite plain, especially when you read the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus came into the world for a specific purpose, and that is that we might know of Him. Uh, when the time was fulfilled, the first thing that Jesus Christ did was He began to preach the Gospel. He began to preach that message of, of, of salvation, how a person could be saved. Of course, He came to do more than that. He came that there might actually be a Gospel what it is that He did to save mankind. And you know, those of you who have recently been interviewed by the session, I hope you remember what it is that Jesus did because that makes up the nuts and bolts of the gospel. Jesus came in our place to live a perfect life, to give His life on the cross for us because He loves us and wanted to save us from the wrath of God. That He, of course was buried, He rose again on the third day, He ascended into heaven, and He sits at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning over everything in the world so that everything would work together for your good. He sits at the right hand of God, interceding for you, praying for you, pleading the merits of His sacrifice so that you would never perish. The gospel basically is that Jesus came to save you. He came to give Himself for you that you might be saved from judgment. He came to do everything for you, everything that was necessary so that you might escape hell and that you might go to heaven. He came that you might know of Him. Now, that's something I think we know very well, at least we should if we are believers here this morning. And let me begin with this question. Do you know Jesus Christ at that level? Do you know of Him? Have you heard the gospel? Have you trusted this one the Bible reveals, who is the Son of God, who became a man and did all these things in order to save you? Are you trusting Him? Have you turned from your sins and are you following Him? Well, this is where knowing Jesus Christ begins. But again, it's much more than that, as we already know. Jesus came, secondly, that you might know about Him, that you might learn about Him. Now, here's, here's an area where I think we need to be a little bit careful because sometimes I think as believers, we see this as the main thing that God saved us for. He saved us so that we might learn about Him. And I'm not saying it's not important. It is important. But sometimes we sort of uh, depreciate the Christian life, we reduce it down to just that. We were saved to study. And so we come to worship and we learn all of these things about the Lord as we hear sermon after sermon. Or maybe we turn on the radio, listen to Christian radio, we listen to sermons, we read books, we read our Bibles. And you know what? It's exciting, isn't it? to learn about Jesus Christ, to learn about God, to learn all the things that the church has learned. I mean, just look at the library back there, full of books, 
full of information, exciting things that are really quite stimulating to the mind. Of course, the problem is, if that's all the further your relationship with the Lord goes, then when the mental stimulation ends, your relationship falls flat. Uh, I know somebody, and maybe uh, at least one other person or maybe two know somebody that used to come to this church years ago who believed that knowing the Lord or relationship with Christ was simply comprehending God. If I learn everything there is to learn and I assent to that, I believe it's true that I'm a Christian. Well, the problem is that he really was only in it for the, stim the, the mental or intellectual stimulation that learning brought. And when he learned everything that there was to learn, and of course no one can learn everything, but at least as much as man was able to, uh, to search the depths of God, his relationship with the Lord ended. He's not walking with the Lord anymore because that is as far as his relationship went. Now, it is important to know about the Lord. There are things that we need to know. I mean, who God is, the triune God, that we might worship the true God. It's important to know who Jesus Christ is, that He is the one who is God and man, that we might trust in the right Savior actually to save us. It's important for us to know what He is like so that we would know what pleases Him. It's important for us to know what we need to do in order to receive what Jesus Christ did so that we might actually be saved. It's important that we know that God is holy so that we might aim our lives in the right direction. Now, again, it's important that we know of Him, that we hear the gospel and that we receive Jesus Christ. It's important that we know about Him so that we trust in the true God and the true Savior and that we are also relying on Jesus Christ alone for our salvation and that we know, again, what pleases God so that we might live the kind of life that He wants us to live. Those things are important. I commend them to you read, study, know about Him. But I want to encourage you again that there is still more than this. He came that you might know Him. In other words, that you might actually enter into a relationship with Him, a personal relationship. I mean, let's not forget, God is a person. And He is, in, in a certain sense, at least the way He uh, expresses himself to us. He is pleased when he sees us doing what is honoring to him, and he is displeased when he sees us doing things dishonoring to him. We've seen on numerous occasions, God dwells in your heart if you're trusting him, and what you do either pleases him or grieves him. The Spirit of God can be grieved. The Spirit can be grieved, the Spirit can be quenched, and we can hurt this person. He is personal. Well, Jesus Christ came that we might enter into this personal relationship with Him. That is, of course, one of the, the main ends of the gospel, that we may know Him, that we may know the true God, and that we may know Jesus Christ whom He has sent. Now, again, let's distinguish what that means. What's the difference between a Christian scholar who, who knows all about God, who knows everything the Bible reveals, who may even be a professor in a seminary and teaches those things, you know, every day. Well, that person can know all those things. He can know all about God and teach those things and yet still not know Him, right? I mean, their seminaries are full of people teaching about God who are strangers to Him. Uh, we're talking about a relational knowledge. It's like the difference between a political analyst who studies the presidents, and he says, yes, I know about Nixon, I know about Reagan, I know about Obama, I know, you know their policies, I know what they're like, and he knows a lot about them, but he's never met them, and he doesn't have a relationship with them, like the people who are around the president who see him perhaps every day, maybe the closest advisors, maybe family members, or maybe even those people who work on the, the White House grounds that he runs into every day. They know the president in a personal way. Well, Jesus came so that you might know the Father and that you might know the Son, that you might know their love for you and that you might experience love for them and have this personal relationship. 
they want you to know, if you've embraced the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Father has really loved you forever. There's never been a time when He did not love you. That's what election is all about. And that He did not choose you and purpose to send His Son into the world for you. That Jesus loves you. And He came into the world even as He was praying in this prayer. He was praying not only for those who were His at that, at that time, but for those who would come to know Him through their testimony. Jesus is a person who has a personal relationship with every single one of His sheep. And He wants you to know of His love for you, that He laid down His life for you so that you might be saved and He might have you as His own throughout all eternity. And Jesus came too that you might also know of the Spirit's love for you because the Spirit is a person as well. He can be grieved. He can be quenched. He has desire, a desire for you to do the right thing, that you might know the Spirit's love in applying Christ to you and baptizing you in Christ, uniting you with Christ and dwelling in your hearts, producing again that love and that Christ-likeness. The Trinity wants you to know Him or them. I mean, it's one God but three persons. And they want you to know that love. So Jesus came that you might know that love. He came that you might experience that love and sense the love they have for you as well as to experience love for them. And so let's again pause and ask the question, do you not only know of Jesus Christ and do you not only know about Jesus Christ, but do you actually know Him? Not as an idea in a textbook, not as characters in a story, but do you actually have a personal relationship with Him? Have you experienced the love of Christ? I think we... Um, saying in this one hymn, uh, we have not known you as we ought, we have not loved you as we ought, it, the, the hymn writer there is expressing things that we often experience. We, we can go through entire days, perhaps entire weeks, not even giving the Lord a thought. And yet, He wants to walk with us. He wants us to walk with Him. He wants us to know Him. He wants us to love Him. And He wants us to know that we are loved by Him. He is a person. And He wants us to know Him. So this is an encouragement. But again, I would encourage you, there's still more than that. Jesus came that you might know of Him, about Him, that you might know Him. But He also came that you might know Him experientially. In other words, that you might experience His life in your life. Now, this is really the full end or the, the full purpose for which the Lord sent His Son into the world is that Jesus Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren, that we might be like Him. That's why He gave us all these things. That being His, as we saw in our meditation, that we might learn who He is, not just by reading the Bible, but through our experiences. I think uh, Jesus has that in mind in Matthew chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. Again, let me remind you, he says, all things have been handed to me, over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. When we yoke together, as it were, with Jesus, when we pick up our crosses and we follow after Jesus and we actually walk in His steps, Jesus is basically saying, I want you to learn of me, but not through a textbook, a classroom situation. I want you to learn about me in life. I want you to live the kind of life I would live. I want you to experience what I would experience. I want you to learn from me in this way. And become like me, Jesus is saying. He wants us, again, in every way to become like Him. We, we read about that in other passages, such as Romans 13. I believe uh, verses 12 through 14, that this is the passage the Lord used to convert Augustine, whom we consider to be one of the fathers of the Protestant faith, although you know, the Roman church considers him also certain elements in his thinking to go along their lines. But we believe he was truly converted. 
This is what Paul says. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. What is Paul telling us we need to do here? He says, as far as the things of the flesh and the world are concerned, put those things off, put them to death. How are you supposed to live? Put on Jesus Christ. Now, again, he's not like a garment that we can sort of wrap ourselves in. He, it's not talking about uh, trying to look like him physically or dressing like him, but it's talking about having his mind and having his heart, speaking like Jesus would speak, thinking like Jesus would think, doing what Jesus would do, having the love in your heart that Jesus had, as well as, of course, having the other things that come with that. Again, Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, in verses 17 through 24, let me just read the, the last, well, let me read this whole thing because, again, it, it shows us how we are to be distinguished from the world by being like Jesus. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their minds being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth as is in Jesus that in reference to your former way of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Again, the Lord is telling us that He wants us to know Him more than just, you know, coming to Him, as it were, through the gospel and learning about Him and even being in a personal relationship, but He wants us to become like Him. That's the reason why God saved us, the reason why He put His Spirit in us to work from the inside out, to transform us into the image of Christ, which is the opposite of what the world is. Do you want an example of what not to be? Look at the world. They're not a, the example that you are to follow. They are the example of things you are to avoid. Jesus is the one you are to follow. The Father wants you to put on the new self and put off the old self. And as you do that, and as you live a godly life in the sight of the world, you are also going to suffer as Jesus suffered. And that's another way in which you get to know Him even more intimately. Again, in the passage we read for our reading of the, uh, the law of God, Philippians chapter 3, verses 8, for, 8 through 11, Paul says, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And usually that's where we stop and we say, I've got His righteousness, I know Him, I'm on my way to heaven. But you see, Paul didn't stop there. He goes on to say that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What did Paul want? Well, he wanted more than just 
to know that his soul was safe, that he wasn't going to hell, that he was going to heaven. He really wanted to know Jesus Christ. He wanted to know this one who loved him so much he was willing to live and die for him, to go through those sufferings. He wanted to know what it was to serve Christ and to honor him with his life. He even wanted to know what it was like to suffer for Christ, and he suffered a great deal. How many of you are willing to suffer for Jesus Christ? How many of you are willing to stand out for Him and to know Him at that level of intimacy? And let me just suggest to you, and I think you know from your own experience, if you have ever suffered for Christ, that you never feel nearer to Jesus than when you are going through that suffering. As Paul again gloried in the fact that he suffered for Christ, it drew him nearer. He knew the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ and beyond just, oh, you're a Jesus freak or I don't believe any of that, you know, but they attacked him. They stoned him apparently to death on one occasion, beat him regularly, and he went through all these various difficulties and finally was executed for Christ. Was he sorry about that? Was he sorry that he was so outspoken about his Lord and his love for him and his desire that others would be saved and took all that abuse? Was he sorry? Now, he's rejoicing in heaven because of that. He glories in that. He's so thankful that God gave him the opportunity to be able to suffer for him because it drew him nearer to his Lord. He knows Jesus Christ in a way that we do not know him unless we actually go through these things. And this is really the goal of everything Paul wanted for the people he ministered to. He said on one occasion to the Galatians, he says, I'm in labor for you until Christ is formed in you. That was his desire as a spiritual parent for his children, that Christ be formed in us. That's what Jesus wants for you. That's what he wants for me. Jesus wants you to know of Him. If you've never uh, heard the gospel or responded to the gospel, He wants you to repent and believe on Him. He does want you to know about Him. He wants you to study His Word, to know who He is and what He's like and what He wants of you, how you know, one really is saved. He does want you to know Him in a personal relationship, that He is a person and He wants you to experience His love and He wants you to love Him in return. But he does want you to know as well Jesus Christ in this more intimate way, which is, again, living like Jesus Christ, living in the power of Jesus Christ, having the Spirit of God filling your heart so that you, you actually you know, want to do that and you do live that way. And as you live that way, as Paul reminded Timothy on one occasion, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted to be willing to be persecuted for Christ and knowing that when you suffer for, for you know, serving Him, for being like Him, that you know Him more intimately. You, you are never closer than, again, when you suffer for Him. That's what He wants you to experience. That's what He wants us all to experience. That is what it means to know Him. So again, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at different aspects of the, of the person of Christ, what, what He was like, and seek to become more like Him. Seek to know what this power of the resurrection is, this resurrection life, what it looks like in our lives, what we should experience. The same things that Jesus experienced. He's our example, right? Not just in the things that you know, we, we like to look at and say, okay, I'll follow you here, but not here. But He's our example in everything. And when you are filled with the Spirit of God, that is what you want to do. You want to live like Him. And when you live like Him, that is when you will suffer for Him. But that's not something to avoid. That's something, as Paul taught us and, and the others who suffer for Jesus Christ, that's something we should really rejoice in. Because, again, it will draw us nearer to the Lord and He will draw nearer to us than any other time in our lives when we actually suffer for Him. Well, let's, let's bow in a few moments of, of prayer and let's uh, ask that the Lord would help us as we apply this. And let's not forget that uh, as we prepare to come to the table, we are looking at what Jesus was willing to do for us in, in His life on earth, what He was willing to suffer. And again, remembering what Jesus received for that suffering, let's let 
that act of love remind us of the Savior and encourage us to be willing to suffer for Him. Let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.